and we are very, very lucky to have on the line uh, Janine Rickards. Uh, kia ora, Janine, how are you doing? I'm good, Leanne. How are you? Yeah, real good. And I appreciate you making time because uh, we have to keep this, not to our usual hour, but one day we'll get you on for some music too because I think you'd have some good songs for us. Yeah, I have a pretty random playlist in the winery usually, so um, yeah. I could we imagine. Could do that another time, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. So Not everyone's cup of tea. <laughs> no, but I think that's the good thing because I've had a few winemakers and some of their song choices are phenomenal and, and, I, and they educate me about a lot of stuff I've never heard of, you know. Mm. Mm, it's cool. So what, what's keeping you busy at the moment, Janine? Uh, well, we're kind of actually... We're, at Erla, where I'm full-time winemaker, we mm. are under construction of an, a really exciting expansion of the winery. So I'm just looking at blending Pinot this morning, um, looking at batches and probably going to be blending those wines earlier than normal. Um, there's also, it's a time of year to make your barrel orders, which is a little bit awkward, but with um, transport of in shipping around the world, you, things are having to be done a bit earlier. So yeah. there's just logistical stuff like that that needs to be done. And I had a bit of time off recently for my own side hustle brand, Huntress. So, you know, just juggling a full-time job and my own business is, you know, it, it makes it for a quite sort of tight schedule, I guess. <laughs> I, can, I can imagine. And it's so cool that, you know, you've got your own personal wine label, which is called Huntress because you are... Uh, a, a hunting, fishing, you know, kind of uh, out in the wild sort of woman, if I can call you that. And, you know, I think yeah. this is such an interesting side to your character. So, but it didn't, it didn't, it, I want to hear the story about when you were, when you were little and you, you saw your dad shoot a goat and then you thought, right, now I'm not eating meat ever again. W what happened? <laughs> um, yeah, well, I, I was kind of mortified. I don't think I thought the whole process through. Um, I grew up on a sheep and beef farm as well, so we had a lot of home kill animals and we had pet, pet pigs for, for meat. Um, so I should have made the connection at a young age, but it took the actual end of the life for me to make, make that um, in front of me and um, think about it. And um, he wasn't going to put up, he wasn't really interested in having a, a daughter that wasn't going to eat meat. He, you know, it's that generation where you've, he feels they, you know, they kind of think it's a central part of the diet, which mm. it's not necessarily, but it's just that mindset and generation. So the next day he had me out um, helping with some home kill processing on the saw and packing up the meat and handling it. And yeah, I kind of um, grew up on a, on a, a big farm and we always had meat. Um, it wasn't until I got into my late twenties that I, um, I kind of was having to, it was, it was very costly experience to buy good good quality meat and I was getting disappointed with the quality so I kind of ventured into hunting just before around when I turned 30 mm. um, but yeah I was pretty mortified when the animal you know lost its life back then and and it's still you know it's not something to celebrate it's definitely um, a, a a significant thing to do mm. to hunt or put down an animal but when you un understand and have been through the whole process for me anyway it, it kind of made sense um and i could accept it and deal with it I mm. guess. as as a process and um, it's it's a much more real and honest way to go about it than going and buying your packaged uh, plastic wrapped meat from the supermarket and yes. i mean i yeah I, I think you know to to hunt to eat to sustain is, is sort of a natural cycle so but it would be hard to to progress to that point but now you're you're committed and it's something you uh, i don't know about you enjoy it's but you, you know important part of your life i guess it is yeah to know where the food on my plate comes from have that connection back whether it be um vegetables or fish or um, or meat. It's I think people need to have a connection because it connects you back to the land, to the whenua. So you, you really have a better understanding. You're more aware of your environment, mm. how how things get to your plate. I think it's an important important thing for people to have a understanding of. Mm. Um, I don't shop at the supermarket very often. I did recently, and it sort of blew my mind. Uh, <laughs> I didn't bet. I didn't buy any meat or vegetables, and it cost a fortune. And I was like, oh my god. This is ridiculous. How could, I mean, I don't have children, but I can imagine it must be quite hard for some families out there right now 
to um, provide if, yeah. if that's what you're reliant on, you know? Yeah. I've got um, homemade sausages and uh, deer hanging up in our chiller at home and I've got, you know, kai moana in the freezer and very, very lucky and grateful for that. Yeah. It's pretty... um, in a veggie garden full of goodies. And they, you know what's gone into them. There's all that ex- mm. extra satisfying feeling of knowing that there's no chemicals, no human interference. It must feel, it must feel really good. Mm. Yeah, no, I'm quite lucky. And I, I hope that um, more people throughout Aotearoa can enjoy um, that connection to their food a bit more. Mm. Um, I'm a little bit involved with Eat New Zealand as a kaitaki and that's kind of their whole kaupapa. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, we're on a good direction to retain some of our wonderful produce in New Zealand as opposed to just exporting it all and, mm. um, yeah, sharing the, the wealth and abundance that we actually have here. What I, we, yeah. yeah, what I liked what you said too in an interview about this is you said, you know, you use everything in the animal and so you, you're making pate and things like that. Yeah, ideally. Um, if you have that time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Juggling it sometimes becomes a bit, you know, the dogs get a few good treats occasionally because it's like I literally don't have time. It's so much, so involved to do that kind of um, charcuterie stuff at home, but I do love it and it's really tasty and nutritious as well. I've just started getting um, some beef through a neighbour here at Erla Vineyard and she has homegrown cattle and she's managed to get through, so she has those animals sorted locally and butchered by a local butcher and then does meat boxes like you have vegetable boxes. So um, Good idea. She's bought the complete cow and I just text her, I said, can I you know, swap a wine for some beef bones so I can make some stock mm. um, you know, and utilise absolutely everything she's getting off those animals. Yeah, it, it's um, so the project for the weekend, and it's totally <laughs> it, it's it's um it's the full cycle of life that the whole sustainability thing, which is just so good if you can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good for you. Absolutely. And how 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 important is your ancestry? Because I, I see it's interesting. You know, I wonder if you find it patronising when people say you're one of the few Maori women winemakers in Aotearoa. Because I've seen a lot of stories that say that, and I'm like, does that bother you, or are you kind of like proud of your Napui uh, Naitirangi heritage? And does that feature much in 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 how you live and and the wine you make, etc.? It's quite an interesting uh, topic. I, I sort of for a while felt uncomfortable with it because I felt like I was put in a box. Yeah. And I, I didn't grow up connected to my iwi or my marae or anything like that. And I'm still trying to, you know, learn a bit of te reo Māori and, um, you know, pick up bits about tikanga and um, mum and I and my brother are actually doing a journey up north to the Hokianga to, um, mum has done all the genealogy and she has all that knowledge just oh. so that we can take on a bit of that. It's, um, very vague for me in my head and I think the journey to visit, um, with mum will be quite, quite good in terms of connecting. Mm. It, it, it is not something that I'm, uh, yeah, I'm still journeying with it and, it's a, it's a long a long path to really come full circle, I think, and feel really grounded in, in that um, history and that part mm. of my papa. Mm. Um And all, all sides, like as well as my Scottish and Irish history, you know, I'd love to get back to Scotland and connect with some of the regions where we originate from there with the settlers that came out. Mm. Um, but I, I do really relate to... Um, uh, te ao Māori and the thought process around um, life and yeah. living. And, and the spirituality yeah. of it too. That's right, mm. yeah. So. I, I think I, I, I'm, I love that side, side of it personally. Uh, it's something that I think the European culture lacks. But anyway, that's for another day because that's a whole other thing to think about. But uh, mm. it's pretty cool. I imagine that's going to be quite an emotional and interesting journey for you up to the Hokianga. Yeah, yeah. I mean, even within the short time of New Zealand's history, we've got so many generations of, um, what do you call it, struggle, trauma, stuff that has gone down that is um, needs to be looked at and thought about and digested and 
accepted by everyone to, I think, move forward as a people. Um, but, yeah, no, I'm really excited to go up north. I haven't been up for a long time. It's a beautiful part of the country. Because mm. so. you're near Martinborough, which is also really lovely, and the wine that comes from there is outstanding, isn't it? Yeah, it's kind of where I've put my put my roots down now, um, I guess. If you can say that. <laughs> I guess she says. You kind of <laughs> yeah. have a tendency to travel and I, yeah, I guess that that come to an end recently. Um, I, I do feel quite settled. I'm lucky enough to have some land and um, a small area of land and a, a home, a new home, which is really quite cool. Um, yeah, I, I love the White Apple. I love its wildness. I mean, mm. most people know the townships just over the hill from Wellington. But when you really get out to Tora, Nawi, you know, Castle Point, they're, they're really quite incredibly beautifully rugged um, places of the country and you can really escape out there, which is nice. Escape the fast pace of modern life and all its, um, all its silly things that keep us preoccupied when we should be actually doing the real stuff like yeah. being in nature. Yeah, it's quite interesting at the moment. I'm going through a big big sort of look at that and um, what's actually important and hmm, maybe we just need to strip away some of the crap we uh, yeah. <laughs> bury ourselves in and make life a little bit more simple and might be more enjoyable. I think so. That's what everyone loved about 2020 when we were locked down is that we could take time. <laughs> simple. Everyone talks about lockdown and time out and being at home and for yeah. us, we were in the wine, wine industry, we were busy, still working. We didn't get that break. I that's, feel like I'm just true. catching up. You were robbed. <laughs> you were robbed. I feel robbed. <laughs> no. But yeah, you're, you're right, actually. Actually, it's interesting. I had another question for you because uh, you were quoted also saying that when it gets to the end of the year, you say you're a pretty chill person generally, but you, you have your stressy times when there's stuff happening and you've got to make these decisions and they're vital to the to the wine and the product you're going to get. It must, it must be quite pressured at times. Definitely. Like, I kind of write off um, February, March, April, May, like, in this quarter of a year, but it's really dedicated to the work, the, the pre-harvest, harvest itself, and then there's a lot of work that happens after harvest that needs to be done. So there's that, that period of the year that's really swallowed up by work, and that's why I quite relate to Matariki and I'm so enjoying that as a holiday and a break. This year I actually took some time off and mm. managed to just um, recenter myself a little bit I guess because it had been such a go, 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 stressful year and, and by the time you get to that half the year's gone, you know. That's true. You get a little bit of downtime and then now we're in spring again and the guys are frost fighting tonight and it's like this cycle that just keeps looping round mm. like the same song they're like oh god and you're like enough I want to get off for a wee bit <laughs> maybe that's what I need to do 20 years doing this but um is it, no, twi- is it, it 20 it. years now gosh it will be next year I think I think yeah mm. I did my first harvest with Christopher Keys who put me in touch with you he did um, thank bless him for doing it was nice of him to do that yeah, yeah. He's yeah, great. He was my first mentor in mine, actually, up at Hawke's Bay and worked with him for a couple of years before I moved down here. Mm. Mm. Well, he thinks the world of you. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen him for a while. <laughs> yeah, he's, um, he's been great and he's, uh, it's, been, it's really fun because sometimes on a Wednesday, Christopher will just appear at the door of his old office where we broadcast from and <laughs> have a big glass of Pinot for myself oh. and the producer and it's like, and he'll, try this, try this, you know, what do you think of this? And <laughs> it's, um, it's entertaining and yeah, he's great. And uh, I, I think um, I really enjoyed uh, discussing uh, winemaking with, with, well, various people, but it's nice to talk to someone in the North Island as well. We've done a lot of Central Otago producers uh, yeah. and... So I want to talk to you, um, I know you haven't got too much longer, but um, specific wines that, um, that are really thrilling you at the moment. Is, is there anything special? I mean, we've talked about Pinot. Uh, it, it, what, what are you loving drinking at this time of year personally yourself, whether it be yours or some other wine? Well, there's lots of new releases popping up onto the market um, and uh, new brands as well, which is kind of always exciting to see some new labels you know, young people starting out with their own younger um, own wines. So I've been enjoying kind of, kind of getting some of them. 
Uh, recently, I did a Hawke's Bay tasting for the Woman and Wine Group here regionally, and we looked at Hawke's Bay wines made by some women up there, and that was outstanding. Mm. So um, good to look at another region in that context, like through a, a lot of varietals. But in terms of, um, I, I really love Chenin Blanc. And oh, yes. Around the place. Good choice. It's great wine, yeah. isn't it? It's so good. Yeah. So good, ageable, um, interesting, variety of styles. That with Riesling would be my go-to whites. Which um, one, sorry? And then, uh, Riesling yes. is another go-to white for me, yeah. again, for the same reasons. You mm. know, you've got stylistically different types of Riesling. Um, it ages really well. Uh, so that, I love rich Chardonnays. Mm. Um, Chablis? Chablis, yes, yeah. definitely. Mm. Uh, what else? In, in reds, uh, I had the Dicey Gamay recently. That was delicious. I was in Raglan, actually. And right. And I um, met Dicey's Gamay, which is young, so that was cool to try some of his wine. I feel like I need to do a trip to Central. It's been a little while. I think but, so. Um, <laughs> I think you do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's, he's so good, yeah. Matt. He's been on the show, and... I think I tried that too, and, and it was phenomenal. He makes amazing wine. Mm, yeah. Well, been in the game a while. He knows what he's doing, doesn't he? Mm. And he's fun. Um, he's got a great great sense of humour, which I think maybe that's vital as a winemaker, do you think? Yeah, I guess so. It helps you get through the tough parts. You know, you've got to look at it and have a laugh at some point. Like Most vintages mm. have got something hilarious in, that you re- remember them by. Yeah, um, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, not necessarily I can talk about all of those on radio, but <laughs> <laughs> they're memorable to me. Yeah. There's some horror moments when it hasn't gone as you expected. Oh, definitely. You couldn't <laughs> couldn't mention one or two? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, right nah. Now, but I, I worked at Pegasus Bay for a few years, and we, we were very intense harvests, and, um, yeah, Work hard all day, all night, and a lot of fun. Um, so they were my South Island vintages, uh, three of them. But I haven't actually worked down there apart from that, I don't think. Um, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? So, you know, you would have travelled tons. I mean, I know, I know you went to Burgundy and they were quite surprised that you hunted because they didn't expect mm. women to do that kind of thing. It seems a little, little bit old-fashioned, doesn't it? Yeah, I did find them a bit um, behind the time on, in terms of that and open-mindedness. I think it's changing. I see there's a few young women um, doing vintage at the moment in Burgundy and having a, a, a good time. Um, I did work in Champagne as well with friends of mine and they, they knew me and they just let me let rip, you know, and do all the muscle work and get, get you know, get grubby. Um, I've worked in South Africa, Australia... In California, in Oregon as well. Wow. But there's lots of places to visit. I think though now it might be just more of a um, tasting holiday. I think. Mm. Eat and drink. Actually, I don't know if I could do two vintages a year. To be honest, anymore now, past forty, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> one is enough. I reckon. I mean, it would be, yeah, because I've talked to other people. Duncan Forsyth mentions that from Mount Edward. You know him, I suppose, as well. Yep. Yeah, great yeah. guy. And, you know, I remember there were certain times of year when you didn't actually approach Duncan. <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't try to see him or anything because he was just, um, you know, n- well, neck deep and Knees deep, and things. literally. Knees yeah, deep, but literally. Yeah. And, um, yeah. oh, it would be, it would have these challenges. And now we're, we're, we're heading into summer and I suppose you've got high hopes for, you know, for a good summer. Uh, because we don't want a long, cold spring, do we? Have you got any kind of gut feeling about how it's going to go? I don't know, actually. I wish I did have that crystal ball. Yeah. I mean, looking at Europe and California and the temperatures they've seen and how early their harvest has been, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. But, I mean, we do have a forecast for a bit more of what we've been seeing in terms of where we are in the Wairarapa. Mm. So, easterly systems... Um, Rain? Yeah, yeah, a bit wetter than normal. Like, honestly, today's rain, when it was raining and we woke up, I was like, please, stop. I've had enough, you know? <laughs> yeah. Let's get through. <laughs> but spring is spring and it's always variable and it's always really windy here as well. So, you know, 
it's part of the magic of, that makes the wines that we we create here what what they are. But it's um, yeah. It's just something you roll with, I, I suppose. You, know. you have to, you know, mm. she's in charge, really. We just kind <laughs> of work around here. Yeah, we Mother work Nature. around Mother Nature. That's dead right. And, yeah, wind's a hard thing, and that's um, it's particularly bad here in spring. It always is. September, October, November can be really tough, you know. Uh, it's Well, you guys are on borderline with sort of snow events as well and some pretty that's right. crazy cold temperatures on, on years. I remember doing the Milford and the... Um, What's the other big track down uh, there? The Root Burn. Uh, Burn. Mm-hmm. We did them, my mum and I, back to back. And honestly, like, we were at Avalanche Risk. It was in November. In November? Late November. Wow. And, you know, they were sort of contemplating helicoptering us oh. across the Milford, but we had to walk it in the end. Yeah, well, <laughs> no. This is the thing. I think I think people forget that and they book it. And, and even December, January, you can get uh, very cold snaps at night. It's unpredictable. Yeah. It's a harsh. It's a harsh climate, actually. But uh, but summer can be can be fantastic. So we so just um, you're very passionate about the food and, and the wine connection, aren't you? Which is really cool because uh, mm. you know when when people um, do, do people seek you out like members of the public and and want to you know chew your ear about <laughs> about wine making and 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 what they like in wines. And do you mind that? Um, I, I guess a, a little bit um, when I'm out and about, but I kind of, if I'm not working, I'm in the bush or I'm um, avoiding that. <laughs> but yes, no, when you, <laughs> I, guess, I guess a little bit. Um, yeah. I've, I've kind of got into wine through hospitality and I've always had a passion for food and I've always eaten everything. And I love, um, I love how wine and food can go together. Mm. Like, not that I've had lots of amazing wine and food matches as such, but when you do hit something of a high note, it's very memorable for your forever. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's like a, a goal. It's like my fitness, probably, my goal there. I'm, like, always trying to achieve something that doesn't always, you know, you don't reach it very often, mm-hmm. occasionally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, yeah. I'm always happy to talk about food and wine. I love texture and flavour and depth of flavour and the savoury elements and layers. And I think with both food and wine, you can have that experience. And then when you match it, right, you know, perfect. It's next level. Mm. Pretty, pretty yeah. great. And then one final thing I wanted to chat to you about is um, you, uh, people love the way that you describe wine because... I guess you're down to earth, and a lot of look. There's a lot of pretentious people in the wine business, isn't there? <laughs> you know, yeah. who, who are a bit yeah. superior. But I read that you once described a, a Voynier varietal as having a background pink smoko lolly flavour, which I think is very good. Mm, yeah, no, I just, I mean, it's all personal experience with flavour and, and profiles and what you've, ex- you've been exposed to. So you've got to be able to relate what you're tasting to something practical. Like break down the pretentious wine talk and just what does it taste like to you, you know? And I think my dad must have had lots of pink smoker lollies around as a kid. Or I remember that that flavour, that cinnamon sort of yeah, and it's quite sharp of, flavour, isn't it? Yeah, I haven't had them in years, but you know, it's like those experiences that stay with you, um, and they're in your in the back of your memory, flavour profile, sort of connection you've got, and so. I just say what I, I really connect to with the wine in terms of flavours. It's nothing, nothing from a, a book. It's, it's a definitely personal because everyone perceives the wine differently. Mm. And and the frustrating thing with wine is it changes. It's an it's a, a living, um, it's a living thing, and it mm. it will change, and you're going to change, and your perception will be different. If you're in a shitty mood or a good mood or who you're with, yeah. what temperature it is, what glass it's in. So not, nothing's ever the same. It's always a, um, evolving, moving, kind of living experience. Entity. Mm. 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 Which, is, which is, makes, for you, makes for an interesting life, doesn't it, as a winemaker? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so creative. Um, I mean, I love the travel earlier on and experiencing uh, meeting new people it's amazing people you've met the connections you've formed like I've got a a French guy who wants to work with us next year and he's just studied with a guy that worked with me but he also worked with another guy that worked in the region like 
10 years ago. So it's like this, the, it's not just New Zealand's quite tight and connected as a region, it's internationally. And so all these sort of dots can be linked. And um, so you've got this incredible kind of community who loves food and wine and it's creative. And every year there's a different challenge thrown at you. It's never the same. Mm, you know? That's right. It might be similar, but the wine's going to be different. And you would have learned and evolved and, and you'll be trying new things. And so, yeah, it's quite an exciting um, industry to be involved in. And it's a whole lot of fun. Food, wine, who doesn't like in, in, imbibing and <laughs> yeah, really, you know, really. the finer things of life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so. ab- absolutely. And travel thrown in, like you say. And, yeah. you know, yeah, so it's it's pretty cool. And would you encourage young women, list, you know, if anyone is young and listening to this, <laughs> young women, you know, a, a, into winemaking a, as, a, as a really cool career and satisfying career? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, well worth it. There's nothing that you can't do. I mean, it's not these, you know, it's... Um, very open and I think, yeah, a different world to other more traditional wine growing regions. Mm. Mm. I think women have a have a really subtle and interesting touch with wine. And let's face it, there's some great Kiwi winemakers uh, who who are women who've done in, incredibly well. But hey, we all, always need more. So, so yeah, I think uh, like. Uh, it, it would be it will be a wonderful uh, thing to pursue, and it's funny how it's not really t- you don't get told about these things. Certainly, when I was growing up, I'm a bit older, but you never got told about these options. But create creative occupations weren't really part of the part of the game then, were they? It was like you know your standard things. But no. it's nice to scratch the surface and and look at these things. You know, uh, it's a very important part of our of our tourism industry too, isn't it? Wine wine tourism now in oh, New Zealand. Huge. Yeah, we're, mm. we're, we're really, um, we're really um, I mean, we're tiny in terms of world scale, but the quality that we're producing, it's really making quite a, a strong impression internationally. You mm. know, like Erla, where I'm working, is um, exporting most of our production um, all over the place. Mm. It's, it's quite exciting to mm. see it being poured everywhere through Asia, through UK, States random countries like Kazakhstan. <laughs> like, it's like, wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that is random. Uh, yeah. But fascinating. Mm. Yeah, well, good for you. Well, Janine, I don't want to keep you long because I've already over-talked past that. I promised you 20 minutes and I know you've got uh, a few things to get on with, but um, it's been fantastic. <laughs> it's um, What's that? Meetings and such. Yes, yes, all that. Like- all those things, <laughs> but I want to say um, because it's um, Maori Language Week, and I just want to have a uh, well, I won't say have a crack, but I'd like to just say something to you to say thank you. So forgive me, uh, but na mihi nui ki akwe, uh, much appreciated. Oh, beautiful, Kia ora, beautiful. That's spot on. Is it? I love it. I, I'm really <laughs> yeah. No, na mihi. Yeah, I have to think. I had to give a karakia for a, a meeting the other day, and I was so nervous. And I fumbled around about it. I think it's just practice, isn't it? It's just mm. getting it slight confidence. It's and confidence. The more we do it, the, the better we'll get. I certainly crave the day where I can confidently stand up and give my, um, you know, give my intro, my um, or mm. Yeah, mm. like that's a major goal for me. Nah, kia ora. Yeah, kia ora. It it's been cool. And uh, ha- have a great afternoon, Janine. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so uh, that was our winemaker for Wednesday here on Southbeat. A uh, really cool uh, woman in every way, I thought. Janine Rickards uh, from uh, the from Martinborough, uh, brilliant winemaker, and look out for her Huntress wines. And wow, she's uh, man, I'd be happy to be trapped uh, on a desert island with her. She can she can hunt, <laughs> she can make wine. I mean, you wouldn't go hungry, you wouldn't go thirsty, uh, you feel quite quite safe with her. Um, yeah, what a woman. Goodness me.